Okay, can I check that people on Teams can hear me okay before we make a start? Yep, fine from my end. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks, I can hear you, Tony. Cheers, Andrew. Okay, so. And yeah, so we're just running off of Niels' laptop, so um, we're not using the, the main camera in the room. I've got the camera on, but Niels does say he moves around a lot, so you may see a blank screen at some points in terms of a, a picture in that regard, but hopefully the slides all work. So we've got the recording on um, to, to do this. Um, Armando, are you able to introduce Niels? Quickly. Can you hobble up and do uh, so. I come there. Yeah, that yes. makes it easier for the room, and obviously you can hear on the microphone a bit better maybe. Yeah. So. so today, what is it? Today is our pleasure to to host uh, to to host Nils Horst from um, Aarhus University in Denmark. <clears throat> so uh, Nils studied uh, his bachelor was about computer science. Then his master was about ecology, if I'm not wrong. And then his PhDs put them together to build these models. So it's a um, uh, he will show us his work at the Gandhi modeling of uh, uh, biological systems. And I think, but without further ado, I'll just leave you. Ah, before, before I forget, <clears throat> Nils will be here for the next three days. In case that you want to have a chat with him, just drop me a mail or try to look at, uh, around in the corridor because it, it will be nice if, you, if we manage to have, to have a chat later as well. So <clears throat> don't hesitate. If you want to meet him later, just drop me a mail. So without further ado, I pass the, the microphone to Nils. Thank you, Armando. Um, so as you can see, it started even before my bachelor's with uh, Lego bricks, and there might even be a connection to my later career there. So it's about modeling ecology, and you can model ecological systems in many ways, so it's not like I'm intent to span, cover all the different ways that you can approach modeling of ecology. So to get a bit more precise, this is the plan for today. Introduction, that's where we are at right now. So one class of um, ecological systems are tritrophic systems where you have three layers of like plants, herbivore and let's say predator. And these systems, it's a classical topic to model, and they include many of the complexities that we that we um, are confronted with when modeling ecology. So I will take that as an example, how to model these systems in general. There are some uh, standard ways, some common ways of extending these uh, basic tritrophic models, and I will go into those. At this point, I should maybe say that there will be no mathematics today. So if you are expecting that, you will be disappointed. Otherwise, you may be relieved. To do modeling, we need some tools to model. And since I am uh, have this uh, bachelor's in computer science, this has interested me a lot, not only to model nature, but also the tools that we use to model nature. So I believe that the tool you choose, maybe you choose the only one that you know, will have an impact on the uh, outcome, on, on the kind of model that you produce in the end. You could also put it the other way around to say, if you have a certain question, you better pick the right tool. What I'm presenting here today is not going to be the right tool for any kind of ecological question, but for quite a lot. In the end, I will show some examples of all of the above principles. So that was that. Try traffic models. <clears throat> so when you are a modeler, you start like maybe looking out the window or looking at a blank paper. And then you very often will start, start out to making some drawings. So this could be a tri traffic system where you have a crop, you have a herbivore or maybe a pathogen attacking the crop and a layer on top of that. Could be all kinds of um, of the components in each of these trophic layers. Very often, it's a crop, and the only reason for that is that cropping systems are simplified ecological systems, which makes them more amenable to modeling. And it's also what you get can get funds to model. So that's that. 
it doesn't begin with the crop. I mean, the crop takes up, uh, it fixates uh, carbon from the air, it takes up nutrients from uh, the soil, and all that percolates up through the trophic layers. The whole system is impacted by weather. When I'm saying the whole system, so it's each of these components is impacted by weather. And for the biotic components, it's impacted by migration. Some would say invasion, if it's something you do not like. And if it's uh, if it, this is a managed system, you got a crop, it's also impacted by the management procedures of the farmer. If it's a protected crop, even the light is managed by the grower. When we observe this system, what we usually observe is what's inside the boxes. We make counts of uh, densities, concentrations, whatever. And we may build some nice time series of that and try to understand what's going on. But the interesting part, as a biologist, the interesting parts are the interactions. And they are kind of, it's not they're non-observable. I mean, you can see uh, the plant grow and you can see a predator eating a prey, but it's very difficult to observe that on a population level. You can only observe it like a few instances of this happening. So that makes it tricky even though these interactions are important for the dynamics of the system. When you think about what these arrows mean, what I drew up here, it's they are all uh, acquisition rates. So it's one trophic layer acquired resources from the layer below. So that's what these interactions are about. And if we look at such an interaction, we could create a model like this, like a little uh, model of just one interaction where on the on the x-axis you have the resource density, so what's at the trophic layer below. And then on the y-axis you have how much the, let's say, a consumer on the next level consumes of that resource. It cannot consume more than it demands, so the demand of the consumer is uh, determined by the size of that population, the status, of it, um, uh, but we are, we also know that the more rich the resource is, the higher density, the more likely it is that the consumer will achieve its demand, that su the supply will equal its demand. How difficult it is to reach that depends on the slope there, I call it apparency, so how accessible is the resource to the consumer? That will differ between different consumer resource uh, interactions. Um, once the supply has <clears throat> been acquired, you can imagine this as biomass acquired or carbon or sugar, whatever is convenient. It needs to be or it will be allocated into growth and reproduction and reserves in the consumer at some cost, which is uh, respiration. So to to put this all together, you can see you have an energy budget there on the left and on the right, maybe some of you, if you come from ecology, you already thought that that was a functional response, which is what it is. So for all of these interactions, we need to quantify the functional response and in some cases also to work out the energy budget, highly relevant to uh, for a plant, for instance. So the functional response, you can uh, you can measure that in the lab, but it's mostly like I would say a student's exercise because this apparency, this slope. I mean, the scenario you have in a lab is very different from what some insect predator or whatever experiences in the wild. So you cannot trust the shape of that, uh, that that will apply in nature as well. But the limit, though, the demand will um, be the same. There's a certain capacity to lay eggs or to, for a parasitoid or to eat for a predator or for a plant to acquire to intercept sunlight. The resource would be sunlight for a plant, same kind of shape, or it could be prey or it could be a host. Any kind of resource depending on which trophic uh, relation we're talking about. 
this is not something I invented, all of that. And that's a general rule in modeling that you shouldn't try to reinvent concepts that are already in place. So if you have something that's described, could be described as a functional response, then do use a functional response. Don't invent something new. This particular way of looking at it is due to my supervisor from my PhD. And that started uh, 30 years ago. Uh, Andy Gutierrez from UC Berkeley um, created this framework for modeling. So to um, summarize this about triatrophic models, you have your model drawn on paper and then implement it on the computer somehow. We return to that. You got your functional responses, how things are related. You find parameters in the literature, wherever you can find it, maybe from your own lab. And you work out the energy budgets as needed. And you run your model and you get some fancy graphs out of it. So now I didn't explain to you how to actually do that, do that or show you how to do that, but that's what comes uh, further down the line. So this standard way of um, looking at uh, an ecosystem, there are some common extensions to that. So for instance, stages, if you are an entomologist, certainly you are used to, uh, in this case, herbivores and predators to be divided into life stages. And now we're splitting up the interactions. So it may be that the larva and the adult of the predator eats the eggs and the larvae of the herbivore. So you just split up these boxes into more boxes, which is OK. <coughs> but now you've got more functional relationships to, um, to describe and to estimate parameters for. Another common uh, way of extending this basic model is to use physiological times. So for instance, d degrees, this uh, rule development rate is linear, is always the case for plants and insects and invertebrates. And you can read um, papers about different ways to model that, but you shouldn't put too much emphasis on Details of it because temperature is very often the ambient temperature. That's what you have access to, but that's not the temperature of the insect or even of the plant. The insect can choose where to where to stay. So in the shade or in the sun, and the plant transpires and cool itself off. I mean, um, just pick any. If you're into this, just pick any curve or line that will fit through these uh, points there. But it's a common part, uh, it's an important part of many models. I will uh, show you a simple uh, example of that. I made this drawing before uh, the COVID um, pandemic, so now we're all experts in epidemics. Uh, before that, there was this, uh, again, a common framework for uh, uh, epidemiology, SEIR, which stands for Susceptible Exposed infectious and recovered. So for COVID, there will be, unfortunately, an arrow back to susceptible. Um, <clears throat> so that you can also consider uh, part of your model. So suddenly some of your boxes might expand into four boxes because you can have the same, let's say, insect in four different, with four different states of infection. Exposed is a bit weird because I guess they ran out of <clears throat> letters because we think of it as infected. So it's being infected without being infectious. And then they call that exposed to use another. To create a nice acronym. Sometimes you might have a vector there having an impact on that interaction. And then it gets um, really interesting for the ecologist. Think of malaria, for instance. So now we need some tools to address this. And 
when I started my PhD, which was 30 years ago, um, a, a year later, I came across this uh, paper by Silvert. And he talked about the future of ecological modeling. And if you are involved in the software, any one of you, this is also at the time where object-oriented programming, object-oriented design became very uh, popular. That's reflected in his wording and his ideas. So you could imagine that in some future, if you wanted to create a model, there were some standardized objects you could take from the shelf and they would represent some different components of the system. If you are, um, maybe if you're an entomologist, you don't want to deal with the details of how soil or plants work. You can just then take like a standard plant model and put it together with your very interesting insect model that you're going to develop. This was before the internet, but yet uh, Silvert imagined that they could be widely distributed somehow, these model building blocks. And you could use the same component, the same building block in many different models. So that makes sense. But how would this be possible even in theory? I mean, think about that. This is our standardized objects of models of different Creatures, they are all animals, I can see. So what was he imagining? So he took uh, like this uh, bat model and then you took like the mouse model and you took like, it's kind of goofy, so we'll take the sleepy donkey instead. And then somehow you, by some magic, can take these and put them into one model and that should work. It sounds like it's in, even in theory pretty Difficult. How could you instruct such standardized objects so that they would work together in a model of a barn, maybe where all three populations would live together? So, to think about that, we need to think a bit like um, a software engineer. Here we've got the model. And the modeler has a canvas, so a canvas is such, it's just a whiteboard or it's a screen or it's the place where you build your model. Nowadays it would be your screen. So there sits the modeler. And to be able to build the model, you will need a library where you could pick components and put them into your model. And you need a place to save your model also. So it's there for tomorrow. Nowadays, maybe on the web or just on your computer. So this is where all the components are. And on the modeling canvas, you put things together somehow. The components must come from somewhere and they have to be, in this case, they must be quite capable components. Uh, so we engage an engineer using uh, engineer's development environment to code these components in an elegant way so the modeler can use them. And there will be some source code, some uh, code to uh, by which these components are implemented. This is not uh, something that worries the modeler because the modeler just takes these fancy building blocks without knowing how they were implemented. And then in the end, some user somewhere can access the model repository which describes how the model has been composed put together and together with the latest version of the components can run the model in some kind of execution system also on your computer so that's a very generic flow of how things can be put together from a systems uh, design perspective we still haven't sorted out how exactly to do it, but it must be something like that. You can see here that it's loosely coupled. The three persons could be different and they could work without knowing each other. And things can be upgraded anywhere without telling the others about it. So um, a lot of software, in fact, nowadays is 
composed just like that. We just have the problem that we have a very heterogeneous world that we want to model. So it's difficult to uh, make this um, generic general somehow. So we need to think about how to do that. So we go back to childhood memories. Oh, there's like Lego bricks. They are all different shapes and um, colors. So those are our components. Because as we all know, you can in fact put them together to build stuff. So these happy modelers working as a team, they are working there on their modeling canvas, taking things from up there to build their model. So that's a nice idea. <clears throat> Some people think that modern software, in fact, has the design of modern software is inspired by Lego bricks. Some people believe that. Anyway, it fits now as a, as a, a description of the idea because the bricks we have, the modeling bricks, is not pieces of plastic, but something more dynamic. It's software. So in general, one of these uh, bricks of these uh, modeling components should be able to take some inputs, do some calculations, and produce some outputs. So maybe it's the uh, it gets this one gets light and temperature, and then it calculates uh, photosynthesis, and that's what comes out at the other end. But it's the density of a uh, host and a parasitoid, and then it tells you how many uh, hosts were parasitized in like a time step of one day. If there are any software engineers among us, they will know that there are two, in principle, different ways this could work. It could be object-oriented, and that means that there's a state inside here. So maybe this, if it's a plant, it knows its own leaf area at this point in time. So it knows how to calculate photosynthesis from the inputs. It knows its area, it knows it's shown how much light you get and temperature, and you can then calculate the daily production of um, biomass. That's one, that's object oriented. The other one is functional. That means that this has no state. Whenever you give it, give it the same inputs values, it will give you the same output values. It's called functional. When I made this drawing, I didn't know anything about functional, but it still fits. Um, the tool I'm going to show you is object oriented, so it has a state inside here, <clears throat> such as biomass or area, whatever. So let's imagine now the user has a question that is then posed as um, with a mouse and keyboard, whatever, asks a question to uh, the model. And then what's going on inside the model without the user knowing it is that it's sent uh, to even other models inside, and some models are composed of other small models. Or when these models are or building blocks, a, a building block for a model is itself a little model. So a lot of things goes on, and then in the end, the user gets the answer. So the modelers asked to put this together. When I did my PhD, my idea was to create a tool that could do this as part of doing the, or as a first step in doing my actual model, which was of uh, aphids in winter wheat, and then all the natural enemies on top of the aphids common uh, modeling topic in the UK, kind of classical. So I did that as well. So I started out making this model and then uh, 20 years later, I wrote to the others that now I had it finished. So I did finish it during my PhD. Oh, it was unsuccessful in that regard. Now it's, um, it's accessible here. That's my lab. So I call it do it yourself, open source modeling because all of this is open source. It's uh, science we're doing, so we cannot hide away 
details. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to demonstrate this, not all of it. Um, this one, the universe simulator, is this execution system. You give it some model description and it gives you the output, like graphs or whatever. Box script here is a simple language by which you compose the model made of this building blocks. That's a canvas. The framework, I will not talk about that, but that's how you can add new building blocks to uh, your toolbox. So master students and PhD students have managed to navigate this and even create their own new building blocks as needed. Using old ones and adding their own. Their own. Um, so we are now come to solutions. I'm just checking my timing here. OK. Solutions. So for solutions, I'm going to show you some examples, some running simulations, and with that illustrate the principles that I laid out for you. Before we do that, I want to show you what we should think about being practical, a little practical. So what are the usual steps you go through when modeling? First of all, you formulate the model and it starts out just as arrow and boxes and you read through the literature, you clip and put together graphs and you get a few simple equations. I'm not a mathematician, so I always look for simple. So if, look, if I see that a double differential or something, I'm, I won't pick that paper. Um, you formulate it somehow. Maybe you write little codes in uh, Python or R or whatever, whatever just to make certain you understand how this little bit of the model works exactly. Then you estimate parameters very often from literature, at least in the first instance, or maybe you did some experiments. Then you verify your model. By that I mean it could mean different things. To me, it means that it very you verify that the model works as you intended it to do. So if you give the plant more light, you get more growth in a response. If you increase temperature, everything goes faster. Sometimes you are disappointed because the model doesn't work as you thought it should. And then you find a mistake. It could be something you miscoded. Oh, it should have been minus, not plus. It could also be that you realize that an important part of the model is missing. Maybe you find out. I got the leaf area and I got the biomass, but in fact, I need to know how much biomass is in the leaves or something. Maybe it turns out that's crucial to get a proper, a function that just works as you would expect it to work. It makes sense. Then sometimes you uh, get um, on, a, on the verification, you get a result that you didn't expect and you look for the error. You spend a long day frustrated that you just wasted a month of work because the model does not behave. And then you realize that the model is right and it was your intuition that was wrong. In fact, this is what should be expected, coming to think of it. So in that case, you already learned something from the model. Calibration is something like regression. It means that you take the whole model and then you try to make the outputs fit a certain uh, data set. In a sense, it's like what you do with regression. It's just more complicated with a simulation model, how to do that. Until now, I have always, when I needed to calibrate a few parameters, I always just did it by hand. I try this, try that. Ah, oh, now it's okay. The more fancy way to do is to do it. Validation is, um, well, you cannot prove anything is correct in natural science. You can only prove something is wrong. So validation means that you confront your model with another data set and see how well it fits. And then you try to get away with explaining why it didn't fit. The problem is that 
we haven't got access to a lot of data sets in ecology because they're expensive. And it's an open system, so it's always, oh, this was a dry year. Oh, this year it, there was an invasion by hoverflies from Southern Europe. This year, whatever. So it's an open system that makes it very difficult to, um, you cannot prove, but it can even be difficult to convince others that your model makes sense. But you should try it anyway to convince others that it makes sense. OK, uncertainty analysis means that some of the parameters of the model will be uncertain for sure. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that a parameter hasn't got just one value, but you expect it to be within this range, maybe. So if you enter that into the model, um, you're also going to get a range of outcomes, and that's the uncertainty of the model. Hopefully it's not too uncertain with regards to the question that you asked in the beginning. Sensitivity analysis means that this uncertainty that you identify, you try to uh, explain. So which parameters are mostly responsible for this uncertainty? Those uh, parameters are interesting for many reasons. If it's a managed system, maybe you can find out. So this management procedure is in fact important for the outcome. This isn't, or it could be a way of pinpointing um, new topics, new research topics, because this is important. We need to know more about this parameter. In the end, you publish this, and uh, you are kind of exhausted at this point, but you publish it anyway. You write a scientific paper. You put your source code somewhere where it's open. And you write some kind of documentation of how it works. Which cannot go into the paper because it's too long. So it goes somewhere else where people can access that. So that's the working procedure. If you thought modeling should be easier than just empirical work, you're wrong. It's not easier even if other people should do the empirical part of it. I'm going to show you uh, two small examples of actual models. Phenology, population dynamics of just one population. Butterflies, kelp. This is the sugar kelp, which is grown on lines in Denmark. And then a tritropic system uh, about insect uh, episodics in the end. So I'll put on my glasses here to, so to be able to see in more detail what I'm doing. Um, and then let's see. This is my universal simulator. As you can see, it was uh, inspired by uh, R. I thought it was R so, it's so uh, successful and you only see. Yeah, and you only see. Um, a prompt, which you don't even see now. But our assistant here will right. make it happen. Yeah. yeah, maybe a PowerPoint should just be turned off. Yeah. And there's, there's a flying squirrel around there. Okay. OK, so this is it. There you see a blank screen, and I've got a prompt up there. So I took the design from uh, R, which was uh, so successful. So I thought I'll just do the same interface. It's just uh, a place where you can kind of load your stuff, like this butterfly script here. So this is software I created, which I started during my PhD 30 years ago. In this software, the each little building block is called a box. We see this as 17 boxes, and each of them might have a name, but they certainly have a description. Programmer would call it a class. It's the kind of behavior this one has. So there are like life stages and output things, whatever. Let's try to run this to see what comes out of it. 
when you run this, you are told that um, an R script has been constructed, put somewhere, and also the an output file with um, something interesting somewhere else. The good news is that something was put on the clipboard also. So if you move over to R and paste there, that's when you are going to see the outputs. So this is the output of that butterfly model. <clears throat> you see the four life stages. In this case, it starts out with 100 eggs in May. Then they hatch, become turn into larvae, pupae, and adults. And on the right hand side, you can see at any point how much, um, what it's like monitoring how many individuals have left this stage. So in the end, they have all left the adult stage because they died of old age. Um, so let's have a look at this script. This is this is the model description. You can say it's the canvas. It's how the model was composed, made of these building blocks, and there were 17 of them. So this is where I describe that. So it runs from the 1st of May to the 30th of September. It takes the weather records from this file. The X starts with an initial 100 X, and they take 140 something to uh, go through. That's the duration of the X stage. The time step is, in fact, from this time box, which is a data degree box with a threshold of five degrees and temperature comes from that weather file. So this is how you put boxes inside each other and how you link inputs to outputs. Remember this graph I showed you, we don't have Lego bricks, we have this box with inputs and outputs. That's what you see reflected here. So this shows um, phenology. So if we run this for several seasons uh, and we add uh, fecundity to this, we should see um, population increase. So let's uh, do that. There's another box script for that. Now we have added um, overposition to this. So the adult will, adult will in fact lay eggs. See how that works out. Run and paste. The right, uh, uh, the left one, well, they both are on uh, log scale now, log 10. I put in that the adult will lay, would lay a 40x total. So over three years, this has been running. It's 40 times 40 times 40 times the 100 we had in the beginning. It's 6.4 million individuals at the end. And unfortunately, that's not the case because butterflies are in fact um, declining. To make this realistic, that this would be the first step. In fact, these are the first steps if you wanted to build this model. You build it of one population, you got to check on its penalty, its fecundity, and then you add all the factors that would uh, oppose this uh, explosion of the population, like parasitoids. So this is a single population model. So let's take something um, different. Let's take a plant, which is this one, Saccharina. It's called Saccharina, this kelp, because it's sweet. This is another kind of model. Notice, by the way, we've got a calendar to keep check up on time. We had that before as well. The environment now is not just the weather. Now we are in the marine environment, so it's also the um, um, transparency of the water and the nutrient contents of the water, for instance. And we got for the, this plant, it's important to have explicit models for the stores. So when uh, the nutrients are acquired from the water or carbon is fixated due to the sunlight, we need to allocate this into different components of the plant. Um, 
bit to run this and see how that works out. In this case, I'm also showing this is in fact calibration. We had some observations. We're building this right now. It has not been published. You see um, the biomass that's per meter of line, so it's a thousand kilograms um, per meter, and the concentration of C and P. It's calibration, and you can see something weird happens at the end. We're not satisfied. The growth is uh, reality less in the end than what the model predicts. So there is some limiting factor that we haven't sorted out. We have not included that one mm -hmm. in the model. We thought it would be nitrogen, but even though it's no, and it's included in the model, the model still doesn't fit. So maybe we learn something new about kelp there. Does grow as much as you would think. Looks promising though. Um, these coming days we're talking about water hyacinth, and you could imagine the same kind of model would be appli applicable for water hyacinth. It's even an aquatic plant. The last uh, example is uh, a triotrophic system. And um, let me load that. That's under review right now. So here you have winter wheat and aphids. And in this first version of, um, of the model, it's um, just that. We have no third level of, um, no third traffic level yet. But weather is not the same every year. So we included in this case, we took 30 different weather files, five years from six locations, that makes 30, from southern Norway. And then we ran the model with just a random weather file every year to see what came out of that. And we get this sort of um, uncertainty on the that's nymphs and adults, top and bottom, without or will wings. Um, left and right. The alate, the adult alate, so winged ones, see the scale, but that's not very many. It's because they leave the field as they, as they um, close and have wings, they just leave the field. So you never see a lot of those, not in the field and not in the model either. So to this, and that's going to be the final demonstration, we added um, Pandora which is an insect uh, pathogenic fungus. And then we ran the model twice in parallel or in tandem, you could say, with or without Pandora. And then we uh, just looked at the end result, not at what happened during the season, but at the end result, result in terms of yield. And we added not only that weather could be uh, uh, uncertain or it is uncertain, but also we had uh, 10 other parameters that were uncertain, very much related to how efficient the pathogen is at trans being transmitted from one host to the other. So we know kind of range of that, but what exactly it is, we don't know. We didn't know either the intensity of the pathogen pressure. We had some, it could be from zero to whatever on a scale. So there are some of these parameters that you just don't know they are inherently uncertain, like weather. Or maybe you just don't know because nobody has looked into it. For instance, in this case, how long time does it take from a, um, an aphid is exposed, it gets infectious, and then it's dead. How long is that lethal period? More research is needed but we put in a span to reflect the current knowledge. So that's a final demonstration here. Let's see, let's load that one. That one. <clears throat> so this time as before, you can see it says that we're running 30 iterations. So in modelers parlance, an iteration means that you 
I've run the whole model one time. And then every time you run the model, in fact, you run it for many days, the whole growing season. So what you get now is uh, look at the top blue one, yield improvement, that's in percentage point. So in the best of cases, if you had Pandora, the our hero in this case that uh, infects the aphids, in the best case, you would have 10 percentage points increased yield by having that present. In other cases, you would just have gain like one percentage point. What you see here is distribution of um, outcomes. It would be nice to know what is the cause of that. Is it due to weather? Then there's very little to be done about it. If it's due to something else, it would be interesting. And that's what sensitivity analysis is for. This is just 30 runs for to sort out when you've got weather and you've got 10 other parameters that are uncertain to sort out which of these are responsible for this variation. You need to run a lot of simulations. So that took like a weekend. Computer worked all weekend. Monday morning, you have the result after a million iterations or something. Then you can sort it out. There's a method to do it, which I'm going to show. Going to this page because this model is documented and it shows that. Sensitivity analysis, this is figure six. These are all the figures from the manuscript. So what you have on the y, uh, on the x-axis, that's the, um, the uncertainty interval. So that's the min and max limits of this that we said, and on the y-axis you have the response. And you can see that, uh, for instance, uh, transmission efficiency. So the more efficient the pathogen is at being transmitted, the higher improvement you have in yield, which is not surprising. So when you get, it's a typical, you have some model and you get some results that People will tell you, okay, so you spent two years on this, so you tell me this. So it's kind of obvious. Maybe it's less obvious that the effect of transmission efficiency is, uh, if it's high enough, if you look at the one above transmissions, uh, you got um, efficiency and then you got yield improvement. The other is, Cadaver prevalence, so these dead apics killed by fungus are called cadavers. If you look at the peak, how many would observe at most? It's not very sensitive to that. So if transmission efficiency is high enough, I mean, it still has a huge impact, whether it's uh, really high or less high, but it's not revealed just by looking at uh, how many cadavers you see in the field. So you cannot assess that from the experience. You need the model to sort out what's going on. That's of course because cadavers are produced and uh, disappear all the time. So um, you need a model to sort out the dynamics. Okay. I have one final slide, so let's see if it's uh, there. I guess it will appear when I go back here. Let's see. I'm going to the end. Just because it's nice to. That was the solutions. Some examples. I just wanted to show that now it's time for questions. Obviously, in the room, you can raise your hand. Likewise, on Teams, if you want to either raise your hand or put something in the chat, um, and I will make sure we turn on the microphone. So I'll give privilege to those in the room because you came, as opposed to those on Teams. But does anyone have a question for Niels? Yes. 
Thank you very much for the talk. Um, you said there are two kinds of models. Yeah. Function based and the application based. And you said the difference is that the. Oh, yes. So, then, so just to say that they can't really pick up yeah. comments. So you so may have to repeat the question. It's so, it like so. the two different kinds of models. So in fact, there are even more. So let me, because you mentioned agent based also. Yeah. Yes. So it's a difference between the questions about if you have a functional model, functional programming language. I think uh, this Erlang, an example. There are some. I think Python can also do this. In a functional language, everything is functions. Okay. But the functions have no memory of what had what have happened before the function itself. So if you ask it something by giving it some uh, arguments, it will also always give you the same answer, which is nice in some way. If you have object oriented, every object like your screen is composed of objects. I'm looking at one here that has uh, a time in it. It shows 11.53. So this one, this object that's shown that it has the ability to, be, ability to be shown on the screen, but it also has an internal state, which is a time, which changes all the time. It's very convenient in ecological modeling to work with objects because whether you have populations or maybe you have individual based modeling, which is something else than what I'm doing, to think of the individual or the population has certain properties like biomass, density, hunger. So that's object oriented. It's characterized by its state in addition to. And then it has some behavior, just like a function has behavior. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So I guess this is a Monte Carlo simulation somehow. So you do some is a statistical, the output is statistical. Yes. Uh, we saw that it was uh, the numbers were hard coded there. Yeah. Duration and um, so how do you get the underlying statistics? So do you decide with, with PDF? Yes. Type, uh, shape, uh, spread. So um, if I return to, if I return to my, this one, so the latest model. So at this, in this case, so you can see a uh, lethal time was specified with this minimum and that maximum. So that's in day degrees. You can see that it's normal. So how can a normal have a minimum and maximum? That's because by default, it's the meter 95% portion. You can change that if you want to. So sometimes you want a uniform distribution. That's what you know. Sometimes you want something that has a shape. Depending on your knowledge. In this case, they were all. Uh, you can see if you want to pick a certain file, it's just a number out of these uh, 30, a number between one and 30. How do you choose all these numbers? Uh, it's very important that these are not just something you guessed at. Yeah. So when you see uh, something, uh, some paper doing sensitivity analysis, maybe somebody in this room did that. So it's just a very bad idea that you take your standard parameters and then you say, what happens if we vary them all by plus minus 20%? This makes no sense to me at all. I don't even know where to begin to say it makes no sense, but certainly if I had chosen some uh, now, this lethal time, in fact, came out to be important. If I had chosen some narrow limits, it would come out as unimportant. If I allowed it to vary only between 55 and 60, the result would be that's not important. Now I let it vary between 50 and 115 day degrees, and it comes out as important. It's important in the light 
that we know that this is the uh, uncertainty that we expect. We have some empirical evidence for it. It's really problematic if you have a parameter in the model where you have no idea whatsoever what the real value is. That's a problem. Then you cannot assess the uncertainty of the model with regards to that unknown. Too bad. It happens. Yeah. This, uh, optimally is in, uh, vision. Uh, I was wondering to, to what extent do you think you've achieved that? The examples you've shown us are very nice, but you've not shown us the, the combining of different. No, so I, had, I, I defined my, my, for myself at some point three levels of uh, success for this. So level one was that I used it myself. And it worked for me. <laughs> I achieved that. It's very easy for me now to make new models. And number two would be that others under my supervision could, on their own, build models with the building blocks I provided, and they could create their own. That's also a success because master students also did that. The building blocks are programmed in C++. The third one would be that one day somebody from I never heard about contacted me and said, hey, I built a model using your tool. Didn't quite happen, <laughs> but there was a researcher a lecture from Brazil who asked if he could use uh, my tool for teaching. I'm using it for teaching also. So uh, I'm not right at level three yet. But still, it has been useful for me and my students, so that's OK. Thank you. One last question. Firstly, thank you for the presentation and being here. Um, I just wanted to ask you with your modeling steps with regards to the fifth one, which was the, the validation. Yeah. And you had said that you really confront your model with another data set to see it to see if it fits. And my question is, in your opinion, is to, to validate a model truly, do you have to validate it out in the field or can you still validate the model with different data sets in the lab itself? So, yes, you can validate it. Um, of course, you have a, a larger burden of convincing the reader. <laughs> but I can imagine that it's doable. Certainly, you can use other people's data. Uh, I've used that a lot. You have some data points, and then you now there's a nice web page where you just click on the dots, and then you go to the X and Ys, and then you can use that, which is completely legal when you cite that. So that's uh, one way of doing it. In some cases, it uh, is possible to build a whole model just from literature pieces. And then you have your own data set. And then you cross your fingers and uh, it works more or less. Yeah, it's just you have this burden. You have this urge. I hope that others will find your model interesting. And for them to find it interesting, you need to convince them that it makes sense. Um, some journals also demand that you validate without saying that what that means. Um, so it's just in your own interest to make the model uh, simple enough that you can explain it in like 10 minutes or 45 minutes. If you make a model so complicated that another one would need to spend one week understanding it, yeah, I wish you good luck with that. I mean, uh, meteorologists can do that, but they also have other budgets than ecologists. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you again for being interested. Thank you. Thank you. Need to shut down the. I think I can do it from here.